Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirates. Welcome to our weekly current affairs quiz. So let's begin the discussion by looking at the topics that we are going to discuss in this week's current affairs quiz. I have chosen nine important topics for a MCQ based discussion which will help you for the upcoming prelims examination. These topics have been carefully chosen from multiple sources including the Indian Express, the Press Information Bureau and other relevant sources. The topics are spread out across different subjects from polity to geography to international relations and let's discuss these topics through MCQ questions so that you can not only revise these topics but it will also give you the practice of attempting MCQ questions. If you guys are benefiting from this initiative, do support us with your comments and your likes and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Before we start the discussion, we have a very important announcement. On the 14th of April, we shall be conducting the Unacademy All India Prelims Mock Test, which will give you a great opportunity to attempt a UPSC standard prelims question paper just two months before the prelims examination. The questions will be set by our expert faculties and you will get an opportunity to attempt both the GS paper and the CSAT paper. So do ensure you take up the mock test and the link for the same is provided in the video description below. So let's begin with the first question. Consider the following statements. Sweep is the flagship program of the Election Commission of India for voter education, spreading voter awareness and promoting voter literacy in India. The second statement says it was launched during the 1951 general elections. And the third statement says ECI gives financial incentives to urban voters to encourage them to vote. How many of these statements are correct? So let's understand the context first. Let's look at the source of this topic as well. And then we will discuss about the sweep initiative of the Election Commission of India. So based on that, we will be able to identify the correct answer. I have picked this topic because we had a press release from the Election Commission of India, according to which the Election Commission has expressed concern about the low voter turnout in several constituencies in the country. Based on historical electoral data, the Election Commission has shortlisted few constituencies which are infamous for their low voter turnout. Unfortunately, many of these constituencies, they happen to be urban constituencies. It also highlights the urban apathy towards uh, casting their vote. And this is something Election Commission has been striving to improve. So the Election Commission has held the first ever conference on low voter turnout with the local bodies that are involved in the conduct of elections. With the municipal bodies and corporations and the district electoral officers and the concerned commissioners of these local bodies, the Election Commission has held a conference to discuss strategies to spread voter awareness and to encourage voters to come out and cast their vote in the upcoming general elections. So that is why the topic was in news. So let's understand what is this initiative known as SWEEP, S-V-E-E-P. -E it stands for Systematic Voters Education and Electoral Participation. It's a voter awareness initiative started by the Election Commission of India in the year 2009. During the Jharkhand elections, that were held in 2009, the Election Commission started this voter awareness initiative in order to encourage the voters to cast their vote and also to promote voter literacy. So this initiative has been a flagship program of the Election Commission since 2009. It works with all the concerned stakeholders, including the media and other concerned stakeholders to promote the importance of casting your vote, to encourage the voters to step out and cast their vote on voting day. So Election Commission takes up many steps, many measures to achieve this. It works with 
media outlets, be it newspapers or uh, internet and social media based platforms or even uh, TV channels to spread the message and to communicate to the electorate. It will work with local authorities and it comes out with many innovative methods to promote the importance of voting. For example, the election commission works with the local service providers like the power distribution companies, water supply uh, boards and in the bills, the monthly bills that are printed, a message is also printed below which basically spreads out the message that voters have to step out and cast their vote which is crucial in a representative democracy. So the election commission uses various such methods. It studies the electoral data, it looks at uh, the voter participation in every constituency in past elections and it will shortlist some of the few uh, constituencies where voting percentage has been historically low. Especially few cities, few urban constituencies, they are shortlisted and the election commission will work with all the stakeholders to promote the awareness. It will also work with schools and colleges and even with the private companies as well to spread out the message to encourage the voters to come out and vote. So all these measures are taken under this initiative called SWEEP. So based on this, we can easily identify which of the statements are correct. The first statement is definitely correct. But however, statement number two is incorrect. It was not launched in 1951. It was launched recently in 2009. The third statement is also definitely incorrect. Because election commission does not give a bribe, does not give any kind of financial incentive for you to come out and vote. It will only spread the literacy, the awareness and encourages the voters in an ethical manner. So two and three are incorrect. So the correct answer is option A. Only one statement is correct. Now let me know how many of you got the right answer in the comments below. Let's look at question number two. Which of the following is part of the Indian Coast Guard's mission. Is it responsible to protect our ocean and offshore wealth, including oil, fish and minerals? To assist mariners in distress and safeguard life and property at sea? To enforce maritime laws with respect to sea, poaching, smuggling and narcotics? To preserve marine environment and ecology and protect rare species? and to collect scientific data and back up the Navy during war. So five statements have been given. You need to check which of them are part of the mandate that has been assigned to the Indian Coast Guard. So let's look at the context and the explanation and then the answer becomes very clear. I've picked this topic because there was a press release by the Ministry of Defense. In fact, not just one. Over the last one week, there were three press releases by the Defense Ministry related to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was frequently in the news. It basically tackled a gold smuggling operation where a few smugglers from Sri Lanka were trying to smuggle gold into Tamil Nadu. The Coast Guard worked with the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence and Tamil Nadu State Police and intercepted these traffickers and prevented the smuggling operation. Plus in Bay of Bengal, the Coast Guard was very active last week. It rescued few stranded fishermen from Bangladesh. It also rescued few Indian fishermen from Andhra Pradesh who were stuck on a fishing boat that had caught fire. So it rescued these fishermen and mariners who were in distress and also tackled organized crime. So that is why the Coast Guard was in news. So let's understand what exactly is the role of the Indian Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was established in the year 1978 through the Coast Guard Act. This Security Force of India, it's an armed force. It has legal backing. Technically, if you look at the functioning of the Coast Guard, it actually qualifies to be known as a paramilitary force because based on its mandate, it lies somewhere between your traditional armed forces and your paramilitary and police forces. But in the case of India, through the Coast Guard Act, the Coast Guard has been designated as one of the armed forces of India. 
it functions under the ministry of defense under the defense ministry so it has been assigned with a set of primary objectives its mission right has been clearly spelled out in the charter of the coast guard and this includes protection of india's maritime boundaries along with protection of india's exclusive economic zone this is one of the primary roles of the coast guard the coast guard is responsible for patrolling india's coastline ensuring that our maritime boundaries are protected and protect india's resources found in our exclusive economic zone be it hydrocarbons fisheries minerals whatever is present in the vast eaz of india it has to be safeguarded by the coast guard along with protecting the maritime borders apart from that the coast guard is also responsible for assisting mariners who are in distress in the sea let's say there is a accident or a ship is about to sink or there is a fire incident on a ship and if the mariners are in distress or if fishermen are stuck in uh, 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 in a disaster for example let's say there is a cyclone and uh, fishermen are stuck at sea so safeguarding the mariners and fishermen rescuing them conducting those search and rescue operations during emergencies during disasters is also a responsibility of the coast guard it is responsible for safeguarding national property at sea as well there could be offshore assets like oil rigs and offshore windmills etc so safeguarding national property at sea is also one of the responsibilities of the coast guard it is also responsible for enforcing all maritime laws related to the law of the sea tackling all forms of poaching smuggling and trafficking bait drug trafficking arms trafficking or gold smuggling smuggling of any contraband into the country so all such illicit activities organized criminal activities are to be tackled by the coast guard which includes piracy as well it is also responsible for conserving and protecting the coastal and marine environment it plays a ecological role in conservation of marine species and the coastal ecosystem and it also plays a scientific role in assisting in oceanic research it will work with the concerned scientific institutions to collect scientific research data which could be useful for oceanic oceanic studies and finally it will act as the second line of defense to the indian navy during times of war in case of a ongoing conflict with the enemy when indian navy is leading from the front and fighting the maritime battle the coast guard will act as a backup as a second line of defense so all these are the prescribed duties of the indian coast guard it's part of its uh, mission and charter so if you come back to the question we can easily say that the correct answer is option d 1 2 3 4 and 5 all the five represent the mission of indian coast guard now let's look at question number 3 the question says who acts as the single point military advisor to the government of india is it the chief of the army staff the defense secretary or the defense minister or the chief of defense staff again to answer the question first we should understand the context talk about the explanation and then the answer will become very evident we had another set of press release Uh, from the defense ministry on the pib website that was referring to the cds the chief of defense staff so that is why the topic was in news so you 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 have already got your answer the answer to the question is obviously the cds the chief of defense staff who acts as the single point military advisor to the defense minister to the government of india now let's understand the role of the cds the chief of defense staff is considered as the highest ranking military officer in the country this office was created recently in 2020 it was approved in 2019 and it was established on 1st of january 2020 so this office is a critical office the cds 
is the highest ranking military officer. He would rank higher than the army chief, the navy chief and the air force chief. And the CDS performs a dual role. The CDS performs a military role and as well as a bureaucratic role. So let's understand what these roles are with regard to the chief of defense staff. As part of his military responsibilities, the CDS will act as the permanent chairman of the chiefs of staff committee. The chiefs of staff committee brings together the three service chiefs from the army, navy and air force. And above them, you will have the CDS, who is a higher ranked officer who can bring synergy between the three armed forces, who can drive jointness, interoperability between the three armed forces. So as part of the military role, the CDS acts as the single point military advisor to the Defense Minister of India and by extension to the government of India. Understood? So this office is modeled on similar lines to what you find in US and other countries as well, where the three armed forces are brought together, the service chiefs in particular are brought together under a chiefs of staff committee, where there is a permanent chairman who is a higher ranked officer who ranks above your service chiefs. So this allows the CDS to bring the service chiefs together, the three services together to drive jointness between the three armed forces. The CDS also heads various tri-service agencies and commands of the armed forces. For example, the Defense Space Agency, Defense Cyber Agency, Armed Forces Special Operations Division. These tri-service agencies and division, they're all part of integ integrated defense staff, which itself is a tri-service institution. And the CDS acts as the head of the integrated defense staff. The CDS also heads the Strategic Forces Command. It, he has superintendence over the Strategic Forces Command as part of India's nuclear doctrine and the CDS is also a member of the executive council of the nuclear command authority which operationalizes India's nuclear doctrine. So CDS occupies a very important military position and the CDS also performs a very important bureaucratic administrative role by becoming the secretary to the department of military affairs within the defense ministry. A new department was created in 2020 in the Defense Ministry called Department of Military Affairs. The focus of this department is to optimize the defense budget, to provide for joint planning, joint procurement and drive theaterization and integrated commands between the three armed forces. So the CDS will automatically become the secretary of this department. So it's an ex officio position by virtue of being the chief of defense staff the CDS becomes the secretary to the Department of Military Affairs. So in this bureaucratic role, the CDS will be answerable to the parliament as well, as far as the armed forces are concerned. And apart from that, the CDS is responsible for driving the establishment of theater commands, integrated joint commands, and to promote jointness, the spirit of uh, jointness amongst the three armed forces, be it in procurement, be it in planning and operations. The goal is to promote jointness and create synergy between the three forces and also to optimize the defense expenditure. So that is why the office of CDS becomes very crucial, very critical. And till date, we have had two senior military officers who have occupied this position. Now, please mention the names of uh, these two officers, right, who have occupied the office of chief of defense staff. You mentioned that in the comments below. The correct answer is option D. The CDS acts as the single point military advisor to the government of India. Let's look at question number four. Consider the following statements. Hydroelectric power projects in northern and eastern regions of India account for over 60% of total hydropower generation in the country. In the southern region of India, only 22% of total hydropower is generated. Any fall in hydro power generation is attributed solely to less rainfall. 
how many of these statements are correct let's look at the context and then i'll provide the explanation we had a press release from the ministry of power that spoke about hydropower generation in india according to the article hydroelectric power projects with an aggregate capacity of 15 gigawatts are under construction which will significantly increase the installed capacity of hydropower in India. See, as of today, we have around 42 gigawatts of installed hydropower capacity in the country. Within few years, 15 gigawatts will be added and by 2031-2032, India's installed hydropower capacity will jump to 67 gigawatts. So that is a significant jump in India's uh, hydropower uh, projects. So it's important to understand which regions contribute uh, to India's hydropower sector and what challenges are being faced in the hydropower sector. Now see, to generate hydropower, which is seen as a clean, renewable form of energy, it is important to rely on perennial sources of water. If you look at the northern parts of India and the eastern parts of India, essentially the Himalayan belt, that is where we find perennial rivers which are fed by the Himalayan glaciers throughout the year. So this is a basic requirement. So when you have these mountainous regions where glaciers are the primary source for a river, the supply of water, the flow of water would be perennial. Plus if you have enough slope gradient like the deep gorges uh, of the valleys in Himalayas, water will flow down at a considerable uh, pace which is sufficient to drive the turbines and generate hydropower. So in India, the northern and eastern parts of India, essentially the Himalayan belt, it has tremendous hydropower potential. So obviously majority of our hydropower projects are located in the northern and eastern parts of India. right? So based on this, you can safely assume that maybe around 60% of our hydropower could be coming from the Himalayan region. So you can take a calculated guess. The second statement, you can address this by looking at the rivers in southern India. The peninsula rivers of India, they are not perennial. They are mainly dependent on monsoons, right? So obviously they won't be contributing much to our hydropower capacity. So second statement also, right, could be seen as correct, right? Even if you don't know the data, let's say, you can still take a calculated guess that, okay, from South India, hydropower projects might be contributing only 20% because of this logic, because of this explanation. Now, the reason why India is prioritizing hydropower projects is because we have a commitment under Paris Agreement. India has committed under its nationally determined contributions to increase its renewable energy capacity to ensure at least 50% of uh, the power that we generate will come from non-fossil sources. We've also committed to reduce our emissions intensity by moving away from fossil fuels. So hydropower occupies a, a key share in our energy basket and India is looking to accelerate the hydropower projects in the country. But however, there is one big challenge. Hydropower generation has gone down in the previous year and this is not just due to low rainfall. Obviously, sometimes we are uh, uh, tempted to assume that hydropower generation goes down from one year to another only due to low rainfall. Because if rainfall reduces or if water supply reduces, it's safe to assume that hydropower generation also goes down. But however, that would be incorrect because there are other reasons as well which could contribute to lesser hydropower generation. The third statement was saying that low rainfall is the only reason for lesser generation of hydropower. That is where the statement becomes incorrect. Because apart from low rainfall, of course, low rainfall is one of the reasons. But apart from that, there are other challenges as well. For example, in the Himalayan belt, landslides, cloud bursts, flash floods are very common. These disasters have affected hydropower plants in the region. Look at the recent incidents and disasters that have occurred in Uttarakhand and in other Himalayan uh, states and how these disasters have affected hydropower plants. 
the Chamoli disaster, for example, right, which was considered as a, a glacial lake outburst flood event, and few other landslides and flash floods in Himachal Pradesh, in Sikkim, they've all destroyed the hydropower plants or damaged the hydropower plants, thus affecting hydropower generation. So there could be other reasons as well, right? So low rainfall need not be the only reason. So it's a very absolutist statement. So that is why statement number three becomes incorrect. Any fall in hydropower generation is attributed solely to less rainfall is incorrect. We can't say it's only because of less rainfall. There could be other reasons as well. But it's safe to assume that statement one and two are correct because Himalayan rivers definitely contribute to more hydropower compared to the peninsular rivers. Also, data from Ministry of Power clearly shows that from southern regions of India, around 22% hydropower is being generated. Whereas in the Himalayan belt, in northern and eastern parts of India, 60% of, of our hydropower is being generated. So two statements are correct. Option B becomes the right answer. Now let's look at question number five. Which of the following statements are correct? Cyber Surakshit Bharat is an initiative of Ministry of Electronics and IT, which implements it with National E-Governance Division. Second statement says, its primary objective is to spread awareness about cyber crimes and build capacities of chief information security officers and frontline IT officials in all government departments in order to enable these departments to take steps to create a cyber resilient ecosystem. So we have to check whether these statements are correct or incorrect. I have picked this topic because we had a press release from the Ministry of Electronics and IT. The concerned ministry with regard to cyber crimes, cyber security is Ministry of Electronics and IT. It has launched an initiative called Cyber Surakshit Bharat Initiative. So under this initiative, the Methi Ministry along with the National E-Governance Division, they have conducted a training program for the Chief Information Security Officers in all the government departments. Even the frontline IT officials who manage the IT systems in all government departments and government institutions, they have undergone training in dealing with cyber attacks and cyber crimes. This essentially makes our government entities more resilient with regard to cyber crimes and cyber attacks. So based on this, we can easily say that both the statements are correct. Both statement one and two are correct. So option C becomes the correct answer, both one and two. It's a factual question, but this is something you should be aware of. It was in current affairs. So there could be a straightforward question on Cyber Surakshit Bharat initiative. You should know which ministry launched the initiative. Who else was part of uh, the conduct of this initiative? What was the purpose? What was the focus? If you know this, you can answer any given question. Let's look at question number six. Which are the four pillars of Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity or IPEF? So four options have been given here. Please go through that and see if you can attempt the answer even before I provide the explanation. This topic was in news because according to Ministry of Commerce and Industry, India and other IPEF countries, they participated in a clean economy investor forum initiative organized in Singapore under the IPEF framework. So let's understand what is IPEF. It's a very important topic under international relations. IPEF stands for Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. And this was an initiative started by the United States. A couple of years ago in 2022, this initiative was launched by the US to bring Indo-Pacific countries together to promote economic prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. This is seen as a counter of the US to China's dominance, economic dominance in the Indo-Pacific. Initially, 12 countries joined the initiative, including India, 
And today, there are a total of 14 countries which are part of Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. It includes major Indo-Pacific powers like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, India, of course, many Southeast Asian economies like Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Brunei. They're all part of Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative launched by the US. So please go through the member countries. It is mentioned over here. Remember all the 14 members. Now let me explain what is the structure of IPEF. See, don't confuse this with a free trade agreement. It's not a free trade agreement. It is essentially an economic initiative, a platform where these member countries can come together to create common opportunities to drive economic growth in the Indo-Pacific. So it's not exactly a trade agreement or a FTA. There are four key pillars identified under IPEF, which includes trade, supply chain resilience, clean economy and fair economy. Under these four pillars, the countries will work together to learn from each other, to help out each other and to bring their policies, their regulations in line with each other so that it can facilitate better economic and trade opportunities to both the sides. The best part about the framework is that a member country can opt only for some of the pillars. Let's say now India is not comfortable in joining all the four pillars of IPEF. We can stay out of one or two pillars and join only the other two. Like building supply chain resilience has been a priority for India. Focusing on clean economy to decarbonize our, our, our economy is a priority for India. Fair economy will focus on uh, dealing with tax evasion, corruption within the government, etc. So these three pillars have been of great significance for India and India has joined only these three pillars. We have not joined the trade pillar because when it comes to trade related issues, India has major concerns when it comes to dealing with developed countries like US, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, etc. It's exactly the same issues we have at uh, WTO or the World Trade Organization. So India didn't want any kind of adverse impact on the domestic industry. So we haven't joined the trade pillar of IPEF, but we are member, we are party to the other three pillars, supply chain resilience, clean economy and fair economy. So under this initiative, the member countries organized a clean economy investor forum uh, at uh, Singapore. And that is why IPEF was in news. So if you come back to the question, the four pillars of IPEF, are trade, supply chain, clean economy, and fair economy. The correct answer is option C. Now let's look at question number seven. The cluster development program, CDP, Suraksha, of the center, basically the central government, is focused on promoting horticulture crops, tackling pests in cereal crops, boosting dairy production, or reversing the depletion of fish. So it's an important government initiative, which you should be familiar with for your prelims. We had this article in the Indian Express that talks about CDP Suraksha Portal. CDP stands for Cluster Development Program and the Suraksha Portal has been launched by the Department of Horticulture. It is led by the National Horticulture Board and it is a great initiative to help horticulture farmers in the country to provide instant subsidies to them so that it can boost horticulture production, which is a key component of Indian agriculture. If you look at India's gross uh, value addition that takes place in the agriculture sector, a large part of it comes from horticultural crops. Almost one third of the gross value addition in agriculture is coming from the horticulture sector. So this is where the government provides certain subsidies to the farmers who are growing horticulture crops, like fruits and vegetables, for example. These are primarily commercial cash crops that can fetch a good income for the farmers. So the government provides subsidies here. For example, let's say farmers want to buy uh, seeds or seedlings or other inputs, right? 
which is essential for uh, cultivating the horticultural crops. Now, previously, there was a big delay in transferring the subsidy to the bank account of the farmer. So, this is where the government is making a difference with a new portal called CDP Suraksha Portal. Now, farmers, all they have to do is they have to download this app. It's a web portal that has been designed, which is implemented by the National Horticulture Board. And farmers can place an order for all the inputs that they want through the portal itself. Let's say the farmers want seeds, uh, the seedlings, fertilizers and, and other inputs which are needed to grow the horticultural crops. They can order all the inputs on the platform itself and they will have to pay only their share of the amount. Let's say 100 rupees is the total cost incurred by a farmer on all the inputs. And let's say government is giving 20% subsidy. Up to 20 rupees, the government uh, will pay. So the farmer has to pay only 80 rupees. And for the rest, a voucher is issued. A e-rupee voucher is issued by the National Payments Corporation of India. So this voucher will now be available to the vendor who is supplying the inputs to the farmer. Once all the material is sent to the farmer, the farmer will have to open the portal again, take pictures and videos with geotag, right? So that the location is also identified and upload those photos and videos to confirm that the inputs have been delivered to the farmer at the correct location. Once this is done by the farmer, automatically now the vendor can use the e-rupee voucher to get this reimbursed. Essentially, the subsidy amount will go to the vendor not directly to the farmer essentially. But for the farmer, it is instantaneous. The farmer need not pay that subsidized amount. The farmer will pay only for the remaining amount, right? So the farmer, for the, far, for the farmer, it's like an instant subsidy. But on the vendor side, a e-rupee voucher is issued and once the delivery is confirmed through uh, video and uh, pictures, which are geotagged, right? Once that is confirmed, then the vendor can reimburse that e-voucher, the e-rupee voucher, right? It's basically a, a voucher system which provides for the subsidy to be delivered directly to the vendor and on the farmer's end, it appears to be an instant subsidy transfer. So this is the initiative which has been launched by the government to promote horticultural crops in the country. So the correct answer is option A for promoting horticultural crops. That is the correct answer. Let's look at question number eight. The term Kalak Kadal seen recently in news refers to a GI tagged sari produced in Madurai region of Tamil Nadu, a unique dance ritual performed in coastal Kerala, a highly nutritious banana variant grown in Karnataka's western ghats, a coastal swell wave that causes flooding in coastal Kerala. It's a very interesting topic actually. This term was in news because we had this article in the Indian Express that refers to a coastal phenomena, a geographical phenomena, which is specifically seen in the southwestern uh, part of Kerala. If you look at India's southwest coastline towards Kerala, there is this fre frequent recurrent phenomena that happens before the monsoon season. Right before the monsoon sets in, in the April to May period, in the pre-monsoon period, there is a coastal flooding that occurs in southwest part of Kerala, which is often confused with a tsunami. It appears to be like a tsunami, where coastal waves, called swell waves, they gush towards the coastline and they cause significant damage to the coastal villages. It also leads to coastal erosion. See, tsunamis are entirely different geophysical events. Tsunamis occur primarily due to uh, underwater events like an earthquake or a volcanic eruption or a landslide, which uh, induces this uh, tsunami wave. But Kalakadal is a very different phenomena. This is a result of the wind activity and the meteorological conditions present in the Indian Ocean right before the monsoon season. In Southern Indian Ocean, we have high speed wind currents that get built up in the pre-monsoon season and this energy gets transferred to the water. So in the northern Indian Ocean, it results in swell waves or 
और हाई टाइडल एक्टिविटी एंड एज अ रिजल्ट कोसल फ्लडिंग विल अकर इन फ्यू पार्ट ऑफ केरला सो दिस टर्म इट्स अ मलयालम वर्ड इट्स मेड अप ऑफ टू वर्ड एक्चुअली कलन एंड कडल कडल रेफर्स टू द सी और द कोस्ट कलन रेफर्स टू अ थीफ सो इट्स एज इफ द ओशन इज कमिंग लाइक अ थीफ एंड स्नैचिंग अवे स्नैचिंग अवे समथिंग फ्रॉम अस सो दैट इज वॉट द टर्म रेफर्स टू सो दीज टू वर्ड्स जॉइन टूगेदर टू फॉर्म कल कडल विच इज ऑलमोस्ट लाइक अ डिजास्टर दैट अकर्स फ्रीक्वेंटली इन केरला इन द प्री मॉनसून सीजन the coastal flooding does have an impact it affects the coastal communities leads to coastal erosion as well and in fact we even have a early warning system for this india has implemented the swell surge forecast system just like we have a tsunami early warning system even for the swell waves there is a forecasting system implemented by incois the indian national center for oceanic information services it's the nodal agency for tsunami early warning as well and it has implemented a early warning system for swe swell wave forecast as well is that clear so that is why the topic is very important the right answer is option d it is a coastal swell wave that causes flooding coastal flooding in coastal kerala now coming to the last question for today consider the following statements Kabil or Khanij Bidesh India Limited is a joint venture company of three Indian public sector undertakings, which includes Nalco, National Aluminium Company, Hindustan Copper Limited, and Mineral Exploration and Consultancy Limited. It has been established under the aegis of Ministry of Mines, Government of India. its mandate is to identify explore acquire develop mine process and procure critical and strategic minerals to ensure the supply side assurance and mineral security of the nation for meeting domestic requirements how many of these statements are correct this topic was in news because we had a press release from the ministry of mines that refers to this joint venture called kabil it was recently established in 2019 in the year 2019 the ministry of mines established kabil kanij bidesh india limited right three public sector undertakings came together to establish kabil so india could also focus on exploration and mining of critical and strategic minerals which have significant economic and strategic value from nickel to lithium to cobalt there are many precious critical minerals and strategic minerals which includes rare earth elements as well which find various applications not just in the civilian industry but also in the military industry so india has a shortage of some of these critical strategic minerals so it requires collaboration with foreign partners it requires exploration with other countries and other companies to source and scout these resources secure them mine them and supply them to india so that we can meet our domestic requirements and become self sufficient because otherwise india is quite dependent on supplies from china and other countries so that is the reason why this joint venture company was established so kabil was indeed set up with nalco hcl and mineral exploration and consultancy limited these three public sector undertakings they formed a joint venture company called kanij uh, bidesh india limited it is established under ministry of mines and its purpose is to explore identify scout and mine critical strategic minerals to meet india's domestic requirements so all three statements are correct option c becomes the correct answer So on this note I would like to bring my discussion to an end. I hope you guys have found the discussion to be useful. All the nine topics that we have discussed along with few related uh topics that I have brought up they are all very very important for your prelims. Do let me know what you think in the comments and also let me know how many of you could get the right answer before I gave you the explanation. So if you benefited from this do press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We'll see you again next week with another episode of weekly current affairs quiz 
Thanks for watching. Have a good day.